Okay, everyone, welcome back to the Art of Masculinity. I have Rob Murgatroyd on here, who I was recently introduced to and feel a great connection with him. We had a great semi-conversation, and then he got kind of pulled off to different directions when we were talking, but um, it was awesome to get to talk to you, and I appreciate you being on the show. How you doing, brother? You know what? I am super excited to be on your show, but you know what the first thing that popped in my mind was, <clears throat> and maybe you, want to, maybe you want to go into this, I don't know. Yeah. But the first thing that popped into my mind was I started doing testosterone injections. I'm 53 years old and um, there's a whole story behind it, which we can get into if you want to. But as we age, our testosterone levels drop. This is not like to be a bodybuilder. This is not anabolic testosterone. But, um, you know, part of our masculinity is hormonal. However, yeah. we slice that. So um, I started and I started, my testosterone was at 401 and the testosterone of a 20 year old is a thousand. Yeah. So uh, yesterday I did the blood test and uh, it's been doing it for about a month and I'm now at 980. So I am, nice. I am uh, 9.8% masculine today. So I'm, <laughs> I'm excited about that. <laughs> well, that's great for the podcast that this is the perfect time to get you on the show. <laughs> it is it is my voice sound deeper oh it does a little bit yeah the first time we met i mean it was a little squeaky but i think you're getting there now <laughs> <laughs> well i am honored to be on your show oh thanks brother i appreciate it and like i said you come with such high regard from multiple mutual friends that i am just thrilled that you decided to come on and share your thoughts with my community and some of what you've gone through in your life and my, with my community so thank you of course man well, I got to get you through the manly round before we get into the uh, meat of the podcast. So this is a way for the uh, community to get to know you a little bit and get to see how you answer these uh, few quirky questions. You ready for it? Let's do it. All right, man. So the first question I have is what is your spirit animal and why? What is my spirit animal and why? Um... I would say, I've never been asked this one, so I want to give you an honest answer. I would say it is the jaguar, and I find the jaguar to be incredibly stealth, fast, strong, proud, cool. I'll leave it there. Yeah, that's awesome actually that's probably like one of my favorite animals in the animal kingdom like not many other animals can actually pick up a carcass and carry it up into a tree and eat it so well let me tell let me tell you how <clears throat> I, I don't know if i'm on the right show or not um <laughs> but um but i have this squirrel in my backyard that's been tormenting me so i come out we just moved to los angeles and so i'm looking out at my backyard while i'm talking to you and I come out, I've got a, I've got a, a 15 pound Maltese poodle and I got a, you know, 25 pound, 30 pound, uh, uh, five year old daughter. And the two of us go out into the backyard and we hear this and we're like looking and we're like, what the hell is that? And the squirrel is taunting us. The dog, it ran after the dog. I thought it was going to bite it. And so today my spirit animal had to uh, call a squirrel hunter to come in. <laughs> And he, he, he trapped the squirrel. They put a little peanut butter in a, a safe cage. They trap him and then they go let him out at the park. Uh, oh, that's blocks. funny. But I know this little, I know this little uh, you know what, is going to find his way back to my backyard. I know it's coming. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. That's 100% positive he's finding his way back there. Oh, he, le he left his markings. He knows where it's at. Don't worry. Oh, that's funny. All right. So I love the Jaguar. That's a great one. Okay. Next one is. What song, whenever you hear it, you absolutely 100% have to start singing to it? Uh, two, Stairway to Heaven and uh, Bohemian Rhapsody. Oh, such good classics, too. Such good classics. Mama. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. So next one. If you were a DJ, what would your DJ name be? You can't ask me that because I spent um, – from 45 to 48 traveling the United States as a DJ. Um, oh, shit. Yeah. I, uh, quit. You want me to tell you why? Yeah. Get into it. Okay. So um, when I, I'm 53 now, when I was 48, let's call it, um, I went to Ibiza 
And uh, I'm not so sure how much you know about DJing, but um, I went to Ibiza and uh, I stayed at this place called the Ushuaia. Mm. And uh, every night there was another major, D- major DJ there. So Monday night was like Tiesto. Tuesday was Swedish House Mafia. Wednesday mm-hmm. was, you know, the late Avicii. Um, and I became fascinated by the ability to take two, three, four tracks on top of each other and make a new song. And so I went home. And I spoke to a friend of mine who owns a, uh, a pretty major nightclub in Atlanta where I was living at the time. And I asked him to give me the name of his top DJ to teach me how to DJ. So um, I spent 10 grand. I bought a bunch of DJ equipment. I created a, uh, a studio um, in, my, uh, in my basement. And uh, he came every week. And before long, I just took to it, got good. And uh, one night he said, do you want to um, go DJ in a club? And I was like, "Mm, in a club club? But he's like, yeah. I was like, well, maybe someday. He said, well, I think you're good enough now if you want to, because I was really into it. And uh, I said, uh, I said, okay, I'll do it. So uh, I worked really hard that day and practiced. And that Saturday night, I went out into um, uh, a club and I had 20 year olds on ecstasy, just fist pumping in front of me all night long to electro (laughs) and house um, music. And I was hooked. And uh, I spent the next uh, four years of my life um, becoming, um, getting even better at it, traveling around the country, doing shows. Um, and then I had a baby. And uh, it was a little difficult to come in at 4 a.m. in the morning with, uh, with a baby. Um, and uh, I had to give it up. And so, yeah, uh, that's, so anyway, if you, if you Google my name and, and uh, DJ, you'll, find, you'll, you'll see all my shows. So what is so uh, what is your DJ name then? My name, Murgatroyd. That's it. That's all you go with. If you can yeah, have because it's, a, it's such an unu- it's such an unusual name that the name Murgatroyd in itself is weird. That yeah. people are like, "Are you a transformer? Like, what yeah. are you?" Yeah. Um, so it just it it just stuck. Oh, okay. All right. All right. I'll buy that. That makes sense. And it is. I mean, but no I will offense. tell you that we came up with another name that we never used. And it was Benjamin Button because um, everybody always tells me I'm, I'm, I'm reversing an age. Yeah. So, so uh, that was the other one. That's awesome, man. I, uh, that's probably one of the things I love about you the most after uh, just meeting you, but also, you know, diving into who you are as a person before this podcast was the fact that you dive into like different shit. And most men would be absolutely terrified mm. to get out of this comfort zone that you seem to say, oh, I know I'm in a comfort zone. I'm going to do something different. And then you go and do something. From 40, at 45, you were doing DJing. I mean, that's crazy. That's crazy. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I always, I always try and look at something. Like, for example, what I'm working on now is surfing. And um, I've, well, let me put it this way. I just moved to LA. My plan is surfing. And so I'm deconstructing what I need to do to be able to accomplish that. So, you know, like it's everything from like, like, what do you wear? You know, yeah. the wetsuit, what do you wear under the wetsuit? You know, what, uh, um, am I a strong enough swimmer to be able to, you know, if I get flipped around in there, who's going to teach me how to do it. And so I try and make it as logical and uh, sequential as I could and break down all of the moving parts that are associated with whatever I'm trying to do. So I'm, I'm working on three things now. One is, um, learning Italian, um, two is um, beach uh, volleyball, and three is surfing. Those are the three. Uh, okay. I, three I feel years. like you're kind of pretty proficient in Italian. I, I've heard you I'm, speak it a little bit, and it's yeah. pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I'm learning. I'm, I've been learning. Well, listen, I mean, I, you know, I spent a couple of months in uh, Europe. Uh, yeah. I just got back from – I've only been here for two weeks, but I spent the last four months in Europe, and two of those months were in, in uh, Italy. So I was practicing and, and learning there. But, you know, it's like anything else. you gotta, you got to take the time to – you know, sure. you got to be in it. And everybody speaks English there now. So, you know, wow. I, I walk in and <clears throat> I'll walk into a cafe and say, uh, you know, uh, io vorrei un caffè per favore. And they'd say, do you want milk and sugar in that too? <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm like, okay, well, you know. <laughs> and I just – can you just help me? Just talk to me a little something. <laughs> oh, that's terrible, man. Yeah. Uh, it's funny and terrible because you're trying and then they're just like speaking to you in English. So you're like, okay, that's right. Thanks that's for right. That. All right. So next, next question for you. We got two more. The next one is, uh, what is something that no matter what anybody, if anybody does it, they look stupid doing it. Mm. It doesn't matter how cool they are.
my, my first reaction was to say dad's dancing at a wedding. <laughs> uh, they look stupid doing, I'm trying to, th everything I'm coming up with, there's, there's always the one guy that does it better than anybody else. So it's not, it's, I, I'm trying, I'm struggling with universally. Everybody is stupid. You know what I think? I think people who are trying to be something other than themselves are always so transparent that they're not being themselves that they look stupid doing it. That, that's, that, that's my answer. That is actually, and I'm not just saying this, that's literally the best answer because I love it. It's true, but it's actually kind of deep. So it's like, okay, you're actually looking at this from a true value, you know, and that's, that's really awesome, man. That's, yeah. that's, I'm gonna have to steal that. Yeah. You look stupid not being you. <laughs> yeah. Good. All right. All right. Last one we got is if animals could talk, which would be the rudest? Oh, that, can I curse on your podcast? Yeah, go ahead. That fucking squirrel. <laughs> I mean, like he taunted me. I was afraid of him. He taunted me. I'm telling you, if you would have saw, he came up, uh, uh, the last squirrel story, he came up on, I've got a deck out here, right? Overlooking yeah. the backyard, like a deck. Yeah. He came up, <clears throat> is this going to, is this a, is just a podcast or it's a video podcast for people? Just podcast, right? Yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll describe it. So he came up onto the deck, wrapped his legs around the, the wooden slats in the deck, arched up like Superman. I was, doing, I was meditating here the other morning. Arched out like Superman, saw me come into, come into my office, at, which is on the deck, looked and went, <laughs> like that. I was like, you motherfucker, I will put a bullet in your head. Of course I didn't. <laughs> I'm kidding about the bullet. I wish everybody could see the face though I'm that you made. Telling you, it's on my Instagram. Go on my Instagram. You'll see. I did. Oh my god, that is freaking hilarious. True story. Oh my gosh. Oh, so good, so good. All right, man. Well, now uh, I love the answers, but now I want to dig into Rob Murgatroyd and kind of where you came from. So I know um, about you, and I know that you spent 25 years as a chiropractor. Correct. I did. And you came to a point where you fucking hated it, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I did. So, you know, look, here, here's the thing. No knock. I have to be sensitive to this because there are people who are still chiropractors. Sure. And sure. I, I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to give the impression that the, that, the, that the career is a bad career. It could have been anything. It just, yeah, for yeah. me, it was, it was 25 years of the exact same problem. My neck hurts, my back hurts, my neck hurts, my back hurts, my neck hurts, my back hurts. Every single day, number one. Number two, I was completely tied to my adjusting table. So if a patient came in to see me, I couldn't be thinking about anything else. I couldn't be on a phone call with anybody else, in a meeting with anybody else. I could only be with that person who was in front of me all day long. So if I opened mm. up at eight o'clock in the morning and I left at seven o'clock, all I can do is be with the patient that was in front of me. So I have, as an entrepreneur, you have all these ideas. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to, I, I, I want to, I, I want to have a meeting and, 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 and do an exploratory meeting about potentially doing something like that. So I was never able to do the things I wanted to do because I was stuck with the patient that was in front of me with the same problem for 25 years. I mean, it was like freaking Groundhog's Day. And I just, I hit a point where I just, I didn't want to do it anymore. I just needed to find a way out of it. So, you know, it was a slow, it was a slow process to be able to, you know, hire a doc to come in to replace myself and, you know, eventually uh, sell the office. And it, it wasn't easy to unwind that, but, but I did not think, you know, when you, when you get a degree in something, you don't realize that, you know, you're going to hit a point where you're going to be doing it for 20 or 30 years and you really better have enough variety in what it is that you're doing so that it seems exciting to you after so many years. Mm, yeah. And I, that was kind of where I wanted to take that, to take your question there, or to take the question I gave you was basically saying for 25 years, you did this. Um, it was a career you made. You invested a lot in yourself to even have the expertise to be in that point. And then you're like, this just isn't for me. And I think a lot of guys really struggle with their day-to-day -day job saying, this isn't really for me, but 
a lot of them aren't willing to take that risk to go out. Like, what did that feel like for you to make that decision to say, oh shit, I'm actually going to transition out of this and I'm going to do it. It was terrifying. It was terrifying because, you know, you, you live your life based on the income that you live your, you know, I don't know how to put this into words. You, you, um, your, your, your status, your level of life is based on how much money you make. It's the, you know, the car you drive, the house you have, the, how often you go out to dinner, you know, your vacations, like you standard living. That's what I'm looking for. Your yeah, standard yeah. of living is based on your income. So when you, when you change that standard of living into something else in the beginning, you're just starting and you got to figure out how to make the money to be able to grow or how to grow that business so you can make the money to replace it. So I had to find a way to, because I had a family, I had to find a way to take my chiropractic, the money that I was making as a chiropractor and be able to create a new job while being a chiropractor Mm. to replace that income. So in other words, I was slowly stepping away from chiropractic while I was slowly stepping into my next career and Mm. they were starting to balance economically. So this, this was a process. So, okay. So go back five years to, if you, if you were asking me like like what do you want i would have i would have said to you i want to not be a chiropractor which by the way that's what everybody tells you in the beginning they tell you <laughs> what, what they don't want right yeah i don't want to be a chiropractor i do want to be living in southern california i do want to be doing things i love like podcasting like traveling the world mm-hmm. um and helping people to um, create the life that, that, that they're really after. Those were the things that I wanted to do. So how was I going to do that? I had to find a way to unwind, Mm -hmm. to unwind the career and create the new career simultaneously. Well, and you did this partly by actually writing this out, didn't you? Yeah. I mean, what, you know, my process was, um, I woke up in the morning and I, I have a process that I learned from somebody named Shalene Johnson called the push goal. Mm -hmm. And a push goal is effectively, what is the one big goal that if you accomplish that goal, it's likely going to knock down some other smaller goals. Mm -hmm. So for me, the goal was to replace my chiropractic income. Like that was, that was just, that was the big goal because I knew that if I accomplished that, then I could move to California. I could walk away from chiropractic. I could travel the way I wanted to travel because now I freed up the time aspect. So that one push in quote goal yeah. allowed me to knock down the other goal. So I woke up in the morning and I, I took out my, uh, my journal and yeah. I wrote at the top of the page, um, replace chiropractic, uh, income by, um, whatever the, whatever the date was. And, um, I just brainstormed as many different ideas that I can come up with to be able to transition out of it. Um, and then, uh, I accomplished the goal. And so, I mean, there's a lot more to it than that about how yeah. things evolve, but that's kind of like the high, the high level. But uh, so at the time that you did this, were you realistically thinking like, oh yeah, this is real. Or were you like, I'm writing this down. This is fucking crazy. I'm gonna write it down, but this is crazy. I was very disappointed or disheartened because I had, ri- I had written it down. I put it on the vision board. I visualized it. And year after year after year, it just wasn't happening. And it, be, it I hit a point where I became defeated. Mm-hmm. I got um, cynical. Um, I got bitchy. And it wasn't until I, I did, I would say three things. Thing number one was create the push goal. Mm-hmm. Thing number two was to set a deadline to walk away from the practice. Not like a, I'm going to be out of the practice by December 31st. Like I'm telling the staff, I'm telling everyone around me that on December 31st, the practice is closing, which means that I either had to have a person to buy it or I had to put a gone fishing sign up on December 31st, no matter what was happening. And 
there was a date where it was over. And it wasn't wow. until I put myself on the line and created pain. So Ooh, that's good. I would say right around June of that, uh, of that year, I said, um, I'm telling the staff, I'm telling everybody that um, on December 31st, um, I'm selling the practice. We're moving to Europe for four months. And then after uh, four months in Europe, we're going to relocate to Southern California. And it wasn't until I did that where things started to change. And what I mean by that is when you know that the asset that you have, right, I've got this million dollar practice. Mm -hmm. If I didn't sell the practice, then if I didn't sell the practice to somebody, I would have lost it because my commitment to myself and everybody around me was that if it's not sold, I'm locking the doors on December 31st and I'm losing it. I'm giving wow. it away. It's gone. So somebody's going to, the patient's going to show up. Where's Dr. Rob? He's not here anymore. It's over. Yeah. So what it forced me to do was it gave me a six month window where I said, okay, I don't want to take this asset. I've spent 25 years building. I got to find somebody to buy this thing. And um, that wasn't easy to do. It really wasn't. I can give you a lot of reasons why it's difficult to buy a chiropractic practice, but it is. Mm -hmm. And so putting myself on the line where no matter what was what created all of the changes. And the last thing was the vision board. I did a vision board differently than I've ever done it before. And what I did was my wife and I created a joint vision board, not one for me, not one for her but a joint vision board board of what we wanted together. And on that vision board, it had pictures of um, Hermosa Beach, which is where we live now. Yeah. It had the coffee shop that we, um, we go to in the morning. It had the yoga studio. It had bicycles, surfing, the neighborhood, uh, my daughter, my five-year-old daughter's school. Yep. And it also had pictures of Italy and um, a few other things, but you get the idea. And we hung it in the kitchen. And every night, I like wine, every night we um, opened a bottle of wine and I sat at the bar uh, in the kitchen and we looked up at the board and we just started talking about it. And I just started saying, uh, I started, my five-year-old sat next to me and I said, you know, that's, that's gonna be your school over there. And we had, pictures of um like the pta meetings at the school here they hold on the beach oh wow um, around the bonfire and so you know i showed her pictures of the pta meetings and um i talked to her you know what do you what questions do you have about that and my wife and then people started coming over the house and they started because it was it was in the kitchen so yeah. they started asking like well what is that well that's that we're, and so it went from my dream, my vision to, oh, that's going to be the coffee shop we're going to, we're going to have coffee in. That's where we're going surfing. And it became our reality. And we started to work out all of the details that are associated with that vision board that were fuzzy. Like what, what date are we going there? Like where exactly are we going to be in Redondo beach? Are we going to be in Manhattan beach? Are we going to be in Hermosa beach? And so it started, it's, it started to refine every night and mm -hmm. then doing that over. And I'll tell you the other thing, when you, when you drink, when you drink wine, not to get drunk, but to relax and to loosen yourself up a little bit, I'm talking like a glass, maybe yeah. two max, right? You uncork, you unlock a level of thinking where your inhibitions are down and you're not stressed and you're relaxed and you're, you're just chill. And so what comes out of you is a different kind of thing. So that's how we did it. That's amazing. And I, I love that entire process you went through because you said two things that terrify men. And I'll tell you, especially men that come from the background that I was in, you said two things, vision board and you journal and you picked up a journal. <laughs> yeah. Two terrifying things, but ultimately created an abundance of success in your life away from the career that you developed and you thought you were going to have for the rest of your life, right? Well, let me, let me talk about the journaling because I think, I think that wh wh where guys get confused is they think of journaling as, you know, like a 16-year-old girl with a lock on it. Yes. That, you know, her mother's going to go in her room and, and look up 
you know, that she lost her virginity or had her first kiss or, you know what I mean? That's yeah. not what, I, that's not what I'm doing. I'm doing a process um, that I can describe if you want me to. Yeah. Yeah. Go um, into it. <clears throat> all right. So the process is called the morning pages and it's written by, uh, it, it's uh, created by someone named Julia, Julie Cameron, um, who was Martin Scorsese's ex-wife and their friends now. And she, she taught writers classes on how to um, get over writer's block. And mm. the process in getting over writer's block is a really simple process that she developed. And the process is you wake up in the morning and you take out an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper and you start writing a stream of consciousness, everything that comes out of your head. So it could be um, something as simple as, um, why is my wife um, acting this way? Why do I feel fat? Why, why can't I make the money that I want to be making? What's wrong with me? I'm so pissed off at my friend, Charlie. Um, and then, you know, you start dumping all of the stuff that is caught up in the RAM of your brain, not yeah. stuff that you are consciously, let's say thinking, but just the insecurities, the inadequacies, the confusing thoughts, the anger, the happiness, the joy. So it could be like, oh my God, I'm so happy. Oh my God, I'm so pissed. Like you're almost like Sybil. You're writing like this crazy stuff that's in your head for the purpose of just getting it out of your head. So after the first one or two pages, you wind up with uh, something that looks like, uh, you know, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer wrote, looks like a murder, <laughs> looks like a murder, you know, thing. Um, and you look back on it, you're like, what the fuck? Do I have all this anger inside of me? Like, what, what is this? And then by the time you get to the third page, you start getting clear and you realize it's almost like you get, you get out of your body and you look at yourself, observing yourself in a very subjective hmm. sort of way. Um, and by the time you get to the third page, you have purged everything that's in your head. And it's like shaking the dust out of a carpet every morning. And the reason why it relates back to, uh, to writer's block is when you have all of that stuff rolling around in your head, it is very difficult to be creative. It's very difficult to be thoughtful. It's very difficult to grow a business, to be um, a, a great spouse because you got crazy that's going on in your head, right? Yeah. So um, what may help your listeners is try and, I write for the garbage can. So I write three pages and then I tear them up and I throw it in the garbage can. Oh, wow. So I'm not writing for posterity. I'm not writing for grammar. I'm not writing to save it. I'm yeah, yeah. writing to dump it, to get it out. And, um, this will change your life. And I, and I, it, it, there's a guy, um, named, uh, Brian Koppelman who created, um, the, te the television show billions. Mm -hmm. And he was on, uh, Tim Ferriss's podcast. And that's where I got the idea from because Tim Ferriss and Brian Koppelman both do Julie Cameron's morning pages process. Um, and he attributes it to him writing, uh, the Netflix television show for Tony Robbins. I'm not your guru. Um, mm -hmm. writing his Billions television show. And um, Tim Ferriss said that he doesn't go, um, uh, there's not a week that goes by where he doesn't at least 70% of his week uh, do this process. So I think it's a, an incredible process. Wow. I love the perspective that you're painting it though. That's something I actually have never heard myself, but I think is very um, important for men to hear is that you, you write it for the trash can. So like a guy thinks they write it and someone's going to stumble across it and they're going to be like, oh, who's this fucking psycho I'm, I'm talking to now, right? Um, but if you're writing it for the trash can to just brain dump, that's amazing to free up, like you said, the RAM and then start producing innovation and creativity. That's really Yeah, the, cool. I, the idea is to not, not journal it, you know, like you're going to get ideas that are just going to come out of it. Like you're going to sure. be you're going to be doing things and what's going to happen is you're going to get good at dumping it and then you're going to get business ideas that are going to come out of it. But that's not really the purpose. You could, I mean, it's another process 
like, you know, I talked a minute ago about the push goal. So yeah. another process is you can write the push goal at the top and then you can journal everything related to the push goal that, you know, I'm feeling insecure about this. I, you know, who am I to be? I got imposter syndrome around this, all that crazy that's in your head. The idea is to journal the crazy out because we all have crazy. We're all freaking crazy because well, we have Rob, a brain. Rob, we're men though. We're perfect. We're supposed to be perfect, right? We can't be crazy. Well, you know what, I, when you get, to, when you get to be old enough, you start to realize that, you know, I don't know, maybe it's because I've done, I've done the work where I've, you know, I've realized that, you know, I'm beyond that now, mm -hmm. um, you know, like that need to, to be perfect. But I know, I know what you mean. I know what you're talking about as men, you know, we've set the standard where, you know, we've got to be, we've got to be the cash machine. We've got to be the you know, the husband, we've got to be the father and we can't do anything wrong. Um, but this process of journaling will help you get out. Even the crazy, like, you know, th there are mornings where I'll, you know, I'll just write, you know, who the fuck do you think I am? Like, why, why do you only come for me for money? What, like I have a 20, I have a 20 year old daughter. Do you know what I mean? Like, why the fuck do you just want money all the time? Every fucking day. It's another, and you know what I mean? Like, blah, 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 you get it out. And then at the end of it, you're like, oh my God, I'm like a, I'm the dickiest father in the world. Like, like she's just in college and she just won $20. What are you being so to dick about? You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. So sometimes we go overboard. I'm just saying that, you know, you got to take the time to get it out of your head. No, I love that. I really do. That's really cool. And that's going to be a tool that I am absolutely going to push people to do um, when I talk to them and tell them to listen to this podcast episode. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. But, man. So one of the other things that um, I love about your background as well is so you when you were doing that transition from getting out the terrifying transition from getting out of being a chiropractor to saying mm -hmm. i want to do what i love and all that stuff and create mm -hmm. this life that you had written down yeah um you was this the time that you and your wife kind of stumbled into that travel blog video thing no. and that, that was okay that was before yeah, that was before it. So um, that was the first, that was like the first wave. And the first okay. wave was like, I was practicing for, let's call it 10 years. And I was starting, that was like right before the DJ time. I was starting to feel like, ah, I'm starting to get bored. Like, I'm just like, I'm not, I'm not excited about this anymore. Like, what can I do to, to get excited? And I was like, well, what do I love? I love travel. So we're like, okay, well, you know, this was right around the time that YouTube started and, you know, there was no Instagram, but Facebook had just started. Yeah. And it was like, well, let's just take some time. Let's just travel. Let, let's, let, I'll get a hire a doctor to cover me for a week and let's, let's do, I remember the goal. The goal was four weeks a year. Let's do one week every quarter. Let's do one okay. week every quarter. And it started with one week a year, you know, like the first year was like, okay, we can do a week this year. The next, next year was like, let's push it. Let's do two weeks and then it was following was three weeks and then you know so within like four years we were doing we ultimately went to i think i think eight weeks is where wow. we like over yeah. over 10 years we just kept building it until we can take eight ten weeks and then what started to happen was you know people started to say to me hey i just saw that you were in mykonos or i just i saw that you were in the south of france or you know whatever um you know can you can you give me some tips can you mm -hmm. tell me what it was like and so being entrepreneurial i was like well I'm trying to figure out a way to get out of this chiropractic thing. And I love travel and, you know, people are starting to watch things on the internet. What if I create a guidebook? Mm -hmm. And so we're like, well, how can we sell the guidebook? You know, cause there's a lot of guidebooks out there. We're like, well, well, let's do something different. Let's create a travel show that's designed specifically to sell the guidebook. So we go to Mykonos, we bring, you know, uh, at the time uh, an HD camera, which was brand new and we'll shoot a show. And we'll, you know, we'll use it to, you know, we'll put it onto the video platforms and we'll try and sell guidebooks. So we did. Um, and that worked and we, we did uh, pretty well with it. Uh, not well enough for me to quit my day job, but we, yeah. it was a nice extra income and it basically paid for all the travel that we yeah. did. So that was the, that was, that was the start. But, but, you know, here, here's the thing. What you don't realize is how things that you do are going to affect you later in life. So I viewed that whole travel thing as a failure. Yeah. And I called it a failure because I wasn't, I, I didn't accomplish the goal that I wanted to, which is to replace my chiropractic income. But what came out of that was a travel masterminds 
that did replace my uh, did replace my travel income. So who yeah. knows, right? Yeah, and 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 you guys have uh, used the connections you guys made from all those years to That's help. Right you give just a great experience in your mastermind, right? That's right. That's right. Like for example, you know, one of the guys that we did um, in the, uh, the Jet Set Life travel show years ran uh, a hotel called the JK Place in Florence. Mm -hmm. And that was 10 years ago. You know, 10 years ago, we went there and we did the video episode. Well, here, you know, 10 years later, I just brought back 20 people to his hotel and sold the entire hotel out and did, um, you know, we went truffle hunting. We did a bunch of stuff um, in, uh, in Italy with him, but I couldn't have predicted it. Like if somebody would have said to me when I was there 10 years ago, shooting that travel yeah. video that I'm going to have a mastermind. I mean, no, what the fuck's a mastermind? <laughs> You're going to have a mastermind that replaces your entire income. Would it, and yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, that, and, 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 and who, and so now I know what's the next 10 years going to be like. Absolutely. Absolutely. The connections you make. And I think that's probably one of the biggest things I wanted um, to get from you to hear that experience was because I think a, a lot of us men, uh, we don't value sometimes because if we're in like this very stagnant place where we're mad at ourselves because we're not better than what we should be, but we're not so pissed off at ourselves that we're depressed, we're just kind of in this stagnant stage. We don't tend to value sometimes the present relationships we're in, not seeing that 10 years from now could be a, we could be a complete changed person and that relationship could have been the causation to that, right? Yeah, I agree. I agree with you. I think, I think you're right. I think that we don't, you know, very often we just take the moment that we're in and think that that is, that that's it. Yeah. And that's not the way it is. It, these are seeds that, mm -hmm. you know, transform into things that are different later on down the road, but we don't know what they are. And depending upon your personality, if you've got the personality that just has to know, and has to be very, very clear about what the path is. Like, you know, like you're a military guy, like, you know, your life depended on predictable outcomes and redundancies and systems and, you know, setting a, uh, like, this is the task. This is the mission. We got to accomplish this mission. If we don't accomplish this mission, somebody's going to die. Do you know what I mean? So there's yeah. like this control that, that you have to have, but I don't think life works entirely that way because you can't control every conceivable. I like, think how many, times do we have these things in our life where it's like there's no way i could have you know predicted or 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 imagined that that was going to happen in the way um it it was going to happen i mean it's it's weird you, you have a you have a minute for another quick story oh yeah go ahead so check this out so before we went to italy i was watching um this television show and on the show it was a it was an episode about how um, this lawyer is helping people who have an Italian ancestry become citizens of Italy. Mm. And I was like, oh, that's cool. You know, my, my, my mother, my last name is, is Murgatroyd. My, my dad's uh, Irish. But uh, my mother is, uh, my mother's family is from Naples, Italy. And her name mm -hmm. is Cecilia DeVito. And uh, so I was like, Huh, I wonder if I can get Italian citizenship. That'd be, that'd be cool because if you get Italian citizenship, then you get an EU passport and mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can live in Spain, Germany, France, whatever, you know, and I was like, that, that would be cool. And so that was just in one ear and out the other. So I'm doing my mastermind in Florence and one of the guys who was helping me with one of the activities in the mastermind, which was a treasure hunt to help people learn Florence um, fast. Um, he said to me, you know, I want to introduce you to a buddy of mine who um, is a lawyer, but you guys would really get along. You guys would connect. It'd be, it'd be awesome. So I was like, okay, I'll do it. So I went out to lunch with him and he started you know, talking about different things. And, you know, he says, I work mostly with Americans. And I said, you know, I saw this Italian, uh, I saw this show on uh, becoming an Italian citizen. And he starts laughing and he's like, who told you? And I'm like, well, no, I saw it. And he said, I just had CBS here shooting. It must, you must have seen my episode. And I'm like, hold on. So I type in YouTube and I look at YouTube. And I was like, holy shit. You were the freaking lawyer that I just saw about how to become an Italian citizen. And oh, like, fun. so my point in telling you that story is you can't predict shit like that. Like no. there's a little woo woo that happens in the world that yeah. moves people the way you need to be moved to have something happen. I, and so I'm just open to anything now. 
So how, how can you kind of describe a way to men, since you've seen this obviously in your life in very significant ways, how can you kind of explain to them the everyday guy? Like this was something that helped me realize I don't have to have control of everything in my life, that things are going to happen and that I don't have to have this set program that I laid out. Well, I think the first part is you have to, you have to be able to identify um, that, that there are different places in your life that require different levels of structure. Like, I think as a man, we're intelligent enough to know that we can try and schedule our wives, but they're going to do whatever the fuck they want to do. Yes. They're going to feel the way they feel. They're going to have the emotions that they're going to have. It's going to change depending on what week of the month. And I don't care what they say. You and I both know that that changes Absolutely. based on, based on where their emotions are. Right. Yeah. You can't script it. You can't manipulate it. You can't control it, but you have learned that women are men, women and thank God that somebody has emotions, right? Yeah. So they yeah. are going to be the way that they're going to be. And we also know that using the example that I use with you in the military, that certain things require absolute structure. So I think it is the skill set of a man to understand that there are certain, that you got to, I, I try and put things in containers, right? There's the container that requires structure and then there's the container that requires no structure. Mm. So some of those containers are just not going to have structure in them and yeah. just know that, you know, you have to be open not to be too woo woo, but you have to be open for a place for the magic to happen. And so I try and create a container where I don't know what's going to come out. I just don't know where it's, where it's going to come out. And I'm okay with it. Am I great at it? No, I'm not great at it. Is, mm -hmm. is it a work in progress? Yes. Some, sometimes I have to be in a situation and say, stop controlling it. Just mm -hmm. let it happen the way it's going to happen and be willing to be open. You can control that. You can control your diet. You can control the gym. You can control um, what books you read. There are plenty of things that you can control. But if you want to control you know, the weather, good luck because that's not going to happen. So I don't yeah. know if that helps, but that's how I know that's super helpful because I think the biggest problem, especially when it comes with military men, just like you kind of hit the, hit the nail on the head, but also in the protective security world where I was also there for five years, we get into this SOP structure, the standard operating procedure. And when you have that standard operating procedure structure and you try to bring that to your life, you struggle when you get out of that environment and say, for instance, and this is the kind of leading to the next question for you is the fact that. Say, for instance, I want to be an innovator. I want to be an entrepreneur, but I've spent 10, 15, 20 years in a military SOP mindset. How do I break from that to become, to tell myself it's okay to be creative? Because I was told for a long time, you couldn't be creative. You had to be this, you know, X, Y, Z. Well, how did you, how did you learn how to step into the SOP world? You were trained. Mm. So it's just a reverse training. It's just, oh. it, it, it's like, you know, the, the way that you, like you weren't born, unless you were born into a military family where you, you know, you're, when you came out of the womb, you had a checklist of what, you know, <laughs> what you had to do. You learned it. And yeah. it's the same way here. You either, you either don't take the time to learn it and get really freaking frustrated with your life, or you do take the time to learn it and create the balance, the yin yang of it all. Nothing, nothing is all one way. I don't care what it is. Mm. You can be crazy about your freaking diet and also really boring. I've met a lot of really boring vegetarians. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, I've also met a lot of sick athletes who are like, you know, exercise anorexics, you know, yeah. they just don't stop training. I've also met people that go the other way where they're fat pigs and they don't take the time to take care of their body. Yeah. So like everything is bad. Like everything we do in our life is balance. Mm -hmm. I don't care if it's standard operating procedure or I don't care if it's spirituality. You got to have balance in everything. Mm, that's awesome. And using some of these tools, I think you've given us today is pivotal into creating that balance. I think as a guy coming from an SOP structure. Yeah, I think so. And I, I think, you know, I think the other part of it is, you know, we, we hit a point as men where our identity is so tied into 
husband, father, male, like all, all of those labels, like we're, we're just locked into the checklist of yeah. what is a husband, what is a father, what is a man, what is all, you know, what is a soldier, right? What, what are all of these things that we're in? And I think our ability to take that identity that we have and not make it big, mm -hmm. but make it small. For example, if I say to you, my identity is I'm a Republican, then I am going to fight you on anything that's other than a Republican. Mm -hmm. If I say to you, my identity is that I am a man, then I'm going to filter everything in my life through being a man. Yeah. So be careful of making your identity so big that you can't allow anything else in because like, this is who I am. I'm a, I'm a man who's a father, who's a Republican. Well, mm -hmm. then you know everything about my life already because I just told you those three things. Yeah. Make the identity small and be open to having lots of identities. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, because and one of the cool things about that is the sense that you, that identity you've even created a lot of times isn't yours. It was created. No. For you. It, it was, was created, created for you. For you. Yeah, or you, you or you borrowed it because you yeah. saw it and you're like, okay, I'll do that. Right. Exactly. So a lot of times you didn't even create that yourself. So figuring out who you truly want to be and then creating your identity around that and being open to, to different things. That is what's more important than, than following the structures that somebody else laid out for you on. This is what a man does. This is what you do when you're 13. This is what you do when you're 21. This is, you know, so having that structure of what a man does at those ages throughout life in our society, that wasn't even created by you a lot of times. So no, and I think the other I think the other thing we have to consider too is that there that there's no rules, right? And mm -hmm. as a man, we want to have the rules. We want to yeah. have the standard operating procedure. We want to know what to do. But the older I get, man, we create our own fucking rules. Yeah. Like like we just like how we live. <clears throat> excuse me. How we live. How much money we make. The lifestyle we want to have the mindset we want to have, the kind of father we, like we create it all ourselves. Like it's all, it's all a freaking illusion. None of yeah. it is real. It's whatever we think it is. Well, and to your point, you, somebody who's traveled the world, men are different in every area of the world. There's different, there's different priorities in each different area of the world for a man. So for us to think there's a certain way and to your point that it's an illusion and that there's no set rules, that actually proves that. You know, that's such an interesting point. Um, you just made me, I'm glad you brought that up because you made me uh, think of something. Here's what I've observed in the last four months along the topic of your podcast. Here's what I've observed. I've observed a lot of things being in, in Europe, um, yeah. as you can imagine. But, but the thing that relates to our conversation my experience, I want to use Italy because that's where I spent the last two months in Florence. And that's the one that had the biggest impact for me. Mm -hmm. My experience with men who are a macho, masculine sort of culture, like, you know, the, the word when you go into like the bathroom, it says masculino on the door. That's mm -hmm. how you know. Literally, it says masculino or feminino. Wow. So like literally that is the culture, right? Yeah. They lead with their heart oh, and not their head. That is interesting. In America, when I come here, it's very, very logical. Mm. It's very intellectual. And there's not a lot of hearts in how people are connecting. So in other words, when one man is talking to another man, they're talking from their head. Mm -hmm. In Italy, the men are like holding each other's hands. Like literally while they're not like in a gay way, but like yeah. they're like, like, like they're, 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 they're like holding each other's hands and they're, yeah. they're talking to each other. And you can lit like, if you had like, if you had like a, you know, like if you could see colors, yeah. you would see like this aura of love that is coming out of them while they're talking to each other. And when they see each other, they kiss each other, you know, on the cheek, yeah. hello, and they kiss each other goodbye. Yep. And there is this deep, familial, um, emotional, heartfelt connection that they have. And when I walk into a store, 
They never, ever, ever once asked me what I did. They couldn't care less. Mm. What they want to know is where's that baby? Where's your wife? Eh. What are you, um, uh, uh, where are you going for dinner? What, uh, what kind of food do you like? And it, like, I'd walk into the store and they would like, you know, stick a fork in a tiramisu and shove it in my face and go, come here, you got to try this. Come on, come on, forget about your diet, Mr. Muscles. Try this. Uh, that's funny. The point is that their culture around it, oh, this is good too. Yeah. I had, I was with my friend Darren and it was, it was late. We were at a bar. And I had a babysitter. They came over and we're at a bar. And it was me and uh, his, him and his wife and me and my wife. And the bartender, we were talking about the differences between the U.S. And, and America. And the bartender said, you know, we kind of look at you guys over there in America like Britney Spears. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you're like a 16-year-old. And I said, why, why do you say that? What, like, why do you say that? He said, well... Like, we never know what's going to happen. We don't know if you're going to shave your head. If you we don't know. That's so good. That's so good. Know, we just don't know what's going to happen. He said, you know that, that ego thing? He said, we worked that out like, like 2,000 years ago. <laughs> we, we, don't, we don't have that anymore. He said, your country's 200 years old. He said, so you're still working out that bubblegum pop thing where you think it's all about you. Right. And yeah. you think the things that you're taking so serious, your work and, you know, your, your, this, your, but the things that really matter are the things that are a little bit more hedonistic. The things like what food are you going to eat tonight? That's going to be amazing. Yeah. What clothes are you going to wear that look beautiful and you're going to love? What family member is going to come over and you're going to have a laugh so hard snot's going to come out of your nose? Where is all of those areas of life and that's how they live their life like on monday morning all the stores are closed and i you know i asked one of the guys why are you closed on monday like you're starting the week and he looked at me and he said well because we're coming out of the weekend i said what does that mean he said well we're you know we said we're, we're you know we're eating too much food on sunday we're with mama we're having dinner we're up late so everything closes on monday because we need a minute to recover uh, and I said, well, but you have a siesta from one o'clock to four o'clock where you close again on Tuesday to Friday. <laughs> so, well, that's because we're up, you know, we're up late at night. We got up early. We got to work. So we need the break. So we take, take a nap. So every, I'm like, it's nuts. So like everything around their culture is built into having an amazing life, mm. having an amazing life with family and food and fashion and culture and, and learning about art and, and all of those things. And none of that is the things that we battle with. Like they don't battle with depression the way we battle with depression. Yeah. They don't have suicide the way we have suicide. They don't have people in high schools that are shooting each other up and killing mm -hmm. each other on the regular. They don't understand that. Yeah. They're like, what, what, what the hell's going on? Yeah. Like why is everybody on antidepressants? Why are they killing each other in high schools? What is going, you have everything. Yeah. I remember the guy said to me, you have everything there. What, what else do you want? And so that level of thinking, because I force myself to, mm -hmm. to go there and to see that level of thinking, it has interrupted my pattern enough as an American, um, as, a, you know, as a man growing up yeah, in yeah. this yeah. environment, and it's no knock to America. It's just what is, right? This is just the way it is. Um, has has caused me to to think a little bit differently. So I'm not. I don't, does that help? No, that was that was great because e even to add on to that piggyback is the fact that most Scandinavian countries only work, I think, three to four days a week, and then they value they have have like a three day weekend. Maternity leave is like they get like uh, two years or three years uh, of the kid's life and they get paid by the company, you know, and, and they treat men the same way and they can take like paternity leave for an extended period of time, like those kinds of things. And yes, to your point is that the way that they think as men and masculine and what is masculine to them is very different to what's masculine to us. So in the, in the roundabout way is it changed your vision of, okay, being a good man now, and being a man in society in general has changed for you. What that means has changed for you. And then in today's society, 
with what we're growing up with as men, we're thinking it's only one way, but this proves obviously that that's not true. And it's not true in a present moment all around the world. Yeah, we are not our jobs. We're working ourselves to death. Oh well, yeah, that's, that's definitely true. <laughs> We're working ourselves to death. And, and, it's, and it's become, I'll tell you, the, it's become virtually ineffective. When you, when you go on working at the rate that we're working without taking time to explore different interests mm-hmm. and to explore different countries and fun and experiences, you, you become ineffective after a while. We can watch as many Gary Vee podcasts as we want or listen to as many as we want. We are going to hit a point where we must take time to reset, to recharge. Mm-hmm. And I believe that the answer to that is um, one week, a quarter, or certainly um, one week every other quarter where you're, where you're literally disconnecting and you're doing something fun. That's why I created the mastermind that I have I'm- to be able to put people into different experiences. I was just going to say, this is perfect because I, obviously I don't want to burn your time. You got your family and you got your other things to get to. But for you coming on and servicing us today and giving a lot of good content to my community, I appreciate you so much. And again, um, it's just a deep gratitude for me to you to, to hop on here with me. But how can we serve you and what are your tricks to making a good life? Well, thank you for that. And I feel the same way. I, I think it's incredible that you're doing the work that you're doing because it takes a lot of, uh, oh, this is funny. It takes a lot of balls to be able to do that. <laughs> um, and uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm proud of you. And I, wanna, sure. I wanted to do this because I, wanted, I want to support what it is that you're doing in any way that I can uh, lend my name for that. Mm-hmm. So um, that's that. Now, as far as like, um, like what I'm doing and how you can support me, um, you know, if you're if you're a guy that uh, recognizes or a girl um, that recognizes that you are working so much that you're not taking the time that you need to reset and you are a higher level entrepreneur and you're interested in being around a tribe of people that are in the same boat and want to um, reset and have some fun together then do, go to um, workhardplayhardmasterminds.com. And um, we do lots of fun stuff. So to give you a quick highlight, this past year, um, we went to Boston. And one of the things we did in Boston was we, um, we went to uh, Fenway Park and we uh, went into the batting cages and we um, had a contest to see who could hit the most balls. Uh, we um, hired Tom Brady's trainer to train us on how he uh, trains uh, Tom and we shut down TV 12. Um, wow. <clears throat> we went to uh, the middle of the year. We went to, um, uh, to Monaco, and I had uh, helicopters uh, fly people in uh, from, uh, from Nice into Monaco. And we did things like a vintage car ride through the French Riviera. And then uh, we did a masterminding goal-setting session in a castle in a small village mm. in Ez. Um, and then a couple of weeks ago, we were in uh, Florence, Italy, and we did uh, things like uh, truffle hunting uh, mm. in, uh, in Tuscany. So these are experiences that, that are designed to get you out of the day-to-day and into some inspiration. So um, anybody that finds that they may be in that category, um, fill out an application. Absolutely. And just to piggyback on that as well is the group you have put together is just amazing entrepreneurs. I know a couple of them beautiful people. And you guys look like you have a ton of fun out there, by the way. And if you are a high level entrepreneur, you're talking to a guy that just did a crap ton of travel throughout his life and made great connections. Trust me, it's going to be a great time. So yeah, it's a lot of fun. You can, you can see all the videos um, on the, uh, uh, on the website. Cool. Well, awesome, brother. I appreciate you. The last question I have for you is what does the art of masculinity mean to you? Um, it means redefining what masculine means to the person. So there's a little bit of a flip on, on your question. And to me, it's leading with, um, leading with my heart, not with my head to be willing to interrupt, um, the patterns that are, um, are regular patterns that keep coming up that, that, define who we think a man is and questioning it and um being true you know i think it was shakespeare or one of those guys said be true to the to thine own self 
And I think to decide what it means to you and to step into that. Mm, so powerful, man. That is so good. I love listening to those and hearing you guys describe what that means to you. So thank you for that. You got it, man. You got it. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Awesome, man. And to all the listeners, as always, guys, drop the ego and stay humble. We'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks, Rob. Thank you.